Alors que nous, on dit que tu es envoyé. Non, mais ben, il commence à In silence, we watch the hills that dominate the skyline behind the port of Genoa slowly fade from view as the Mistralis' sleek white hull sails seaward. Thinking of the thousands of ships who have made this crossing over the centuries and unloaded their cargoes of gold and spices at Genoa, when the glorious city of the Middle Ages controlled the sea routes in the eastern Mediterranean. Retracing the route followed by those ships of the bygone era, we make our first stop in Naples, then on to the island of Santorini in the Cyclades archipelago. Continuing eastward, we pass the Isle of Cyprus and then Tartus in Syria before reaching our destination, Beirut in Lebanon, the gateway to the eastern Mediterranean. An overnight sail brings us to the Bay of Naples, a sheltered harbor in the shadow of Mount Vesuvius. Over the centuries, successive dominations by the Normans, the French and the Spaniards have sculpted Naples' history, just as they have influenced all the other great coastal cities along the Mediterranean. Called the capital of southern Italy, Naples is a busy commercial and tourist seaport. Many ships sail from this port to Ischia Island, or especially to the Isle of Capri. The city was originally called Neapolis, or New City, and was of little historic interest until 79 AD, 800 years after it was first founded by the Greeks. But in 79 AD, Vesuvius erupted catastrophically, burying the Roman towns of Herculanum and Pompeii under several meters of ash and scoria. The proximity of these archaeological treasures, its beautiful bay and the elegance of the old city, have made Naples a major port of call for cruise ships. We've gone from controls that require little more muscle to these controls which are smaller, electronic controls, but which nevertheless develop enormous power. We're getting used to it. It's a little like power steering in a car. It's the same. Despite all the high technology, there's still a level of tension on the bridge. It's always a little tense because the ship doesn't stop with brakes. She weighs 22,000 tons, so there's quite a lot of inertia. We have to really concentrate on what we're doing and watch what's going on so we can stop her in the time required. We've decided to spend a few hours on our Neapolitan stopover in the Scapanapoli area. Its name is derived from one of the Roman roads that cut through the ancient city, dividing it in two. One can still find traces of the old roadbed. The old patrician homes have long since been replaced by baroque buildings whose facades are generally painted in two colors that are significant to Naples. Red representing the lava from Vesuvius and yellow from the bountiful sunshine. Life in the street is rich in theatrics. A perpetual stage play recounting the city's history. To understand the Neapolitan people, you have to delve into the history of Naples itself. Since time began, the town has always had a strategic position in the Mediterranean. Naples has been influenced by so many cultures, the ancients, the Egyptians, the Greeks, the Africans. And when it became a great capital, it absorbed part of the European culture. Naples has managed to take the best of these influences, and the Neapolitans have drawn a certain form of savvy from the cultural mix.
Laundry hanging from the windows to dry despite the often unhealthy living conditions. The Scapanapolitans lead a simple life, maintaining their animated and colorful Neapolitan heritage. This is Neapolitan pasta. Spaghetti. I have spaghetti. Ah, oh, there's no more. But I have candeles. It's the real Neapolitan pasta. And there's also mozzarella. Mozzarella made exclusively from buffalo milk and inspected. Pizza, the global ambassador of a unique Italian cuisine known around the world, was born in Naples. But the pizza purchased in this Scapanapoli alleyway bears no resemblance to the usual fare. Pizza occupies a special niche in Neapolitan history. It's said that the white from the cheese, the green from the Brazil, and the red from the tomato symbolize the colors of the Italian flag. This fried pizza was featured in a 1950s movie starring Sofia Loren and Vittorio De Sica called The Gold of Naples. During the difficult days after the war, one could buy a pizza and not pay for it until eight days later, which is why they're sometimes referred to as eight-day pizzas. There are 238 churches of all sizes in Naples, from the main cathedral to the small Baroque chapels in Scapanapoli. Devotion to religious beliefs is another Neapolitan trait. The end of the year celebrations will soon be upon us, and Via San Gregorio is jammed with shoppers coming to buy the famous Neapolitan ornamental figures. Some like these at Mr. Ferrino's are veritable works of art. Via San Gregorio Armeno is the place to find the Neapolitan ornamental figurines. The famous writers from the 18th century lived on this street. One of them, San Martino, created the first of these figurines during the reign of Queen Mart and King Francis of the Bourbon family. It is the finest school of Neapolitan ornamental figurines. The tradition of making the figurines from terracotta dates back to 1836, and my family has practiced this method since that time. I am the fifth generation, and every day I work to preserve this art form. It is a tradition that is important to every family, whether they are rich or poor. They make a crib in their home because the crib represents the love, warmth and joy of the family. We must leave the hustle and bustle of Via San Gregorio and start back to the port. Our Neapolitan stopover ends at sundown. Standing on the deck of the Mistral, we watch the Bay of Naples slowly disappear from our view. The second night aboard ship is traditionally called Captain's Night. Resplendently attired in his finest uniform, the captain is introduced to each guest. Uh, 
Bienvenue, welcome, welcome, and bienvenue to you. Bienvenido, Captain François Scheder. Captain, do you prefer to be here on the bridge? Well, that's a difficult question. I like them both. Yes, both. Is this part of the ritual? It's part of the cruise. The captain welcomes his guests. He makes personal, direct contact with them at the beginning of the cruise. It's good. Daybreak. After a 30-hour sail, we arrive at Santorini. Slowly, the ship sails into the submerged volcano's caldera, now filled with seawater. We drop anchor at the foot of the cliffs that are crowned by the White House of Fira, the island's capital. While the passengers make their way to the top of the cliff, we head in the opposite direction, back to the center of the caldera. George, our guide, is a volcanologist and knows every single rock and piece of lava in the area. For years, like a doctor at a patient's bedside, George examines the caldera, takes its pulse, watching for the slightest sign of activity. Let's say we are in the center of the Santorini Island group and we are uh, on Paleakameni, the old burnt island, uh, which is in the center of the depression that has been created by the large Minoan eruption. The island of Santorini underwent a dramatic change 2,500 years ago. Literally exploding in its center, the volcano then collapsed inward on itself. The sea then surged into the center, creating the present geographic appearance. Centuries later, a new eruption created the island of Palia Kameni. Uh, this is uh, very interesting because it's the youngest land in the eastern Mediterranean. So this is uh, the top of a large uh, uh, submarine volcano that began to build up uh, after the Minoan eruption, after 1630 before Christ. And for the first time came in light, uh, came above sea level at uh, this place here in 46, 47 nowadays. <laughs> Most of the color is the black one that you can see. And uh, this is uh, the color of the fresh lava that has been uh, cooled rapidly. So there is a lot of glass, so that, that's why it's black. Then you can see uh, a range of colors from red to yellow. The red one uh, represents the oxidized iron and the yellow one is uh, the color of the alteration of the rock. The hot water and the hot gases, the hot magmatic gases, alter the rock and they produce, they put just uh, also a little bit of sulfur and so we have the yellow colors. This confirmed that Santorini continues to be an active volcano. And so we expect uh, some kind of eruption in the near future. Okay. 
this possibility of another eruption doesn't seem to worry the investors. They've turned the Cyclades Islands into Incredibly violent tremor destroyed a large part of the city, wiping entire neighborhoods off the map. Buoyed by their strong religious beliefs, the elders talk of the events simply and fatalistically. The other two women were there? Yes, there were. Our houses were close. Oh, really? My neighbor was sitting inside her house. You were living in Fira? No, I was living here, in the church quarter. There, near the church. At one moment, my neighbor said, Are you sleeping? Well, yes, I am, I answered. You didn't feel the earthquake? Of course I felt it. With all this noise, the neighbor arrived, so I got up, and there was a second quake. That was when the church collapsed. Earthquakes, volcanic eruptions, we've always had them. These things are not human, no. They are divine, truly. My opinion is that Atlantis was here. This was the, the, the place that uh, helped Plato to, to make uh, this myth, this legend. We had, uh, you can consider, we have about 80 billion tons of rock ejected into the air. And the destruction of the most uh, prosperous uh, society in the Aegean area. And that's why I consider Santorini is the place of, of the Atlantis. Leaving the mysterious and fascinating island of Santorini behind us, we continue our eastward journey across the Mediterranean. Our next port of call is the island of Cyprus. Finally underway, the passengers now have an opportunity to acquaint themselves with the amenities and facilities on board. The Mistral's hospital is particularly well equipped to address any medical emergency that may arise among the 1,500 passengers and a crew of 500. The ship's doctor works alone and sometimes must confront serious cases. Therefore, he must be an emergency physician, someone trained and prepared to deal with such varied cases and cases of a serious nature. We have everything we need on board for cardiac patients who require intensive care and everything necessary to perform routine emergency surgery. 
On a medical level, the Mistral is exceptionally equipped. This ship has the Rolls-Royce of dialysis machines, the NEC. This means that passengers who need regular dialysis may now benefit from the cruise, and that's a positive thing. <laughs> After a few days at sea, the passengers fall into a cruising rhythm. Each day, marine art and history buffs gather around Jean-Pierre Raymond and watch him paint seascapes in watercolor. Mais avec votre permission, hein, sans ça, je fais rien. C'est très libre. Ça fait rien. Le bouquet, c'est un prétexte à s'amuser. Alors, qu'est-ce qu'on nous fait, nous Oui. I'm always amazed. We all fear the blank page. Happens every time. For all of us. And then suddenly it comes to life. And we're happy. We're the creator. I find him incredibly and absolutely optimistic. He wants people who've never done anything creative in their lives to do creative things. And to spend an hour on one thing alone is a pleasure. Even if we aren't successful, it doesn't matter. Change some money. Ask the cruise staff what to expect at tomorrow's port of call. We've sailed 370 miles since leaving Santorini, and Limassol on the Isle of Cyprus is now in sight. This stopover in Cyprus gives Jean-Pierre an opportunity to get another perspective of the Mistral for the artist a rewarding experience. When you love ports, as I do, the ports of Holland, everywhere in the world, something happens. You're hooked in spite of yourself. You have to be really useless to do a bad job of it. Zoe, a member of the cruise staff who is originally from Limassol, will use this stopover to spend the day with her family whom she hasn't seen for several months. According to mythology, at the dawn of time it was here, on one of the island's most beautiful beaches, that the goddess of love, Aphrodite, came down from Mount Olympus and founded Cyprus. And despite several thousand years of successive occupation by all the great civilizations of the Eastern Mediterranean, Cyprus still remains, even today, the island of Aphrodite. The Romans conquered the island in 58 BC and built a picturesque town called Paphos. Recent excavation of some of the old Roman houses has revealed exquisite mosaic stone floors constructed by the method used in that period. First, slaves collected vividly colored stones from the nearby beaches. These stones, called tesseries, were then sorted and classified. Roughly one cubic centimeter in size, they were sometimes coated with colored molten glass to produce the desired patterns. Starting at the center of the floor, the master mosaicist would create, but usually copy or adapt a design. In this case, he copied a figure from old masterpieces and Christianized the work. The Middle Ages, like antiquity, has left its mark on the Isle of Cyprus. In 1191, Richard the Lionheart had almost accidentally conquered Cyprus while participating in the Third Crusade. The dungeon of the commander's residence at Colossi was the headquarters of the Hospitallers of St. John of Jerusalem. The Ottoman Empire ruled the island from 1571 until the mid-1800s. Yet the Cypriots never swayed in their allegiance to Greece. Cyprus proclaimed independence in 1959, but was invaded by Turkish forces in 1974. 
Despite the invasion, the residents of Eroskipos seem oblivious to the presence of a Turkish influence in their daily lives. Women don't go to the traditional cafes, but there are other cafes where they usually go. To make a typical Cypriot cup of coffee, first I take the sugar, then the coffee, and then hot water. I put it into the hot sand, and when it rises it foams, and I pour it into the cup very, very slowly. And that is a Cypriot coffee. Stella is serving Cypriot coffee to her customers, while across the road Evdorika is busy making a Yeroskipos delight, otherwise known as Turkish delight. Turkish delight is made with sugar from corn flour. Different flavors and almonds are added at the end. You put it in a container and leave it for a day. The next day, you cut it, like you see here. I have no idea who invented the Turkish delight, but here in Cyprus, in Paphos, my husband's grandfather used to make it. He used the secret recipe of the Greek Isles, especially the one from Syros. I didn't actually choose the name Aphrodite for my shop. Like Yeroskipos, it means Aphrodite's secret garden. And the name came to me, just like that. It's almost sunset when we arrive in Omodos, 900 feet above sea level, in the heart of the wine country. The majority of Cypriots are members of the Greek Orthodox Church. Even in the smallest villages, daily life is centered around the church. After making a ceremonial sacrifice, Father Constantine tells us the history of the holy relics on display in his church. This church, dating back to the 3rd century, used to be a monastery. When St. Helen arrived in Cyprus, she left a piece of the Holy Cross in the church of a monastery in Stavavoris. She entrusted the rope that had been used to tie Jesus Christ to the cross to the monks of the Omeros monastery. This piece of rope is the only one in the world that has been preserved. In 1054, a schism developed within the churches that pit the Pope against the Patriarch of Constantinople that led to the separation from the Roman Catholic Church. The Orthodox religion has gone on to develop a liturgy that includes candles, hymns and signs of the cross. But what is fascinating to a lay person attending an Orthodox service for the first time is the mysterious iconostasis, a screen or wall covered with icons that separates the nave from the choir and the priest from the view of the worshippers.
once again, we are at sea, continuing on our eastward course. Now, far from the holy atmosphere of the church at Omodos, we're preparing to indulge in another ritual, a secular one that is repeated devoutly every evening at the same time in the galley of the Mistra. The preparation of a thousand and one delicious dishes for hundreds of faithful who have gathered expectantly in the dining lounge. Magnetized by the view we watch from the Mistral's decks as the lights of the houses on Cyprus slowly fade into the distance. At night's end, we are at Tartus, a former Phoenician trading post that today is Syria's second largest port city and is our gateway to the Orient. Syria is a land of steppes and mountains and although a large country, its coastline along the Mediterranean is barely 110 miles in length. Tortos, as the town was called in the Middle Ages, was the home of the largest Templar castle. It was the principal port of the Frankish states and a route to the Holy Land. During the Crusades, innumerable ships loaded with pilgrims from all branches of Christianity disembarked at Tortos. Relying on the abundant oil resources, Syria has become a modern secular state where the Islamic majority has demonstrated tolerance toward the Christian community. Education is top priority in this country. It's available to boys and girls equally and is considered one of the main factors for social development. In the 1950s, more and more people moved from rural communities to bigger towns. Consequently, Tartus, like most Syrian towns along the coast, experienced a population boom. Today, the residents are slowly reconstructing the old medieval quarter that was built between 1188 and 1291. Scenes from everyday life can be witnessed inside the walls of the citadel, scenes that are carried out with joy and at the same pace as the legendary Middle Eastern nonchalance. About 25 miles from Tartus, the crack of the nights crowns one of the Alawite mountain peaks. This remarkable castle has defied time for nearly 900 years. Overlooking the Beka Valley, it commands the territory for miles around. This strategic site was the setting for the battles of Ramses II against the Hittites. After the conquest of Jerusalem in 1099, most of the Crusaders reclaimed Europe. It's said that Godefroy de Bouillon was left for a time with a troop of barely 300 soldiers to defend the Holy Land. So citadels rose up throughout the country. The Crack of the Knights is one of the mightiest and most striking of these stone structures ever built. It housed a garrison of 2,000 men comprised of Frankish soldiers as well as Armenian, Muslim and Christian mercenaries. In the 1930s, during French mandate over Syria, France was seduced by this majestic castle that symbolized a Western secular presence in the East. The French purchased the castle and restored it, relegating the inhabitants who lived there to the village below.
At nightfall, we head back to Tartus. Although women are not officially excluded, the center of social activity, the cafe, is reserved for men. All ages meet there to play cards, backgammon, or to smoke the nargile and listen to music. The pleasures of Middle Eastern life abound. Fragrances of tobacco, honey, and apple fill the air. But Islamic law forbids the sale of alcohol. The traditional mint tea and cardamom coffee are the standard beverage fare. Still dizzy from the intoxicating sense of the Tartus Café, we find ourselves back in the tranquil quarters of the Mistral, cruising peacefully through the night towards our next and final port of call, Beirut. At the dawn's first light, we round the seawall that marks the entrance of Beirut's port. Now that Lebanon is no longer a country in turmoil, the tourists have returned, notably the cruise ships. Yet one can't stop thinking about the 15-day war that totally destroyed downtown Beirut. The sun's first rays are caressing the city as we birth, a reminder that Beirut claims the title, the city that won't die. Built on a promontory that now borders the coast road, Beirut dates back to 2000 BC. Vestiges of the ancient city have been found near the famous rocks that are a symbol of Beirut. It's from high on these rocks that betrayed lovers used to throw themselves off. To get a feel for the city, we make our way over to Hamra Street, Beirut's main shopping district. The lively atmosphere on Hamra Street, which connects downtown to the coastal road, is reminiscent of life in Beirut before the war. In the heart of a thriving multi-confessional country in the 60s and 70s, derogatorily referred to as the Swiss of the Near East, Beirut combined business and French-speaking communities. 
Although this part of Beirut's history eludes the younger generation, they somehow still feel attached to it. People tell us about Beirut, what it was like, the souk, the Rivoli, the Grand Theatre, the famous opera that's behind us. They tell us about things we have never known. We feel something, but things are static. So we try our best to bring them to life through pictures or words. We try to explain them. The young people are trying to dig into the past to find a certain identity so they can move into the future. It isn't easy to forget the war, it takes time for the scars to heal. It's important to go back a little into the past to try to transcend the ramifications of the war. And that takes time because it's hard to erase from memory. I can't help thinking things could explode again. In what manner, I don't know, but I certainly hope it doesn't happen. Every neighborhood was touched by the war. Only the downtown area, the heart of historic Beirut, where the different factions occupying the east and west confronted each other, was completely destroyed. With great determination, the city has been restored to its original state. But what has become of its inhabitants? Grain merchants, tinsmiths, textile merchants, everybody. We all came to Beirut for everything we needed. We were attracted to the city, its well-ordered society. We came to shop. It was the capital and offered a wide variety of things. And it was a place to meet people. Life in Beirut under the French rule was glorious. Many Lebanese identified with France, and this mutually positive relationship between the two cultures encouraged development. However, the people wanted the cities under French mandate to have a neo-Arab, or rather neo-Moroccan character. It is evident that Beirut has been very well reconstructed. I personally believe the quality of the work is unique. Leaving Beirut, we head northward to the mountains. The word Lebanon before it was the name of the country, referred to the mountain chain. Dominating the littoral, Mount Lebanon reaches its highest point at almost 10,000 feet. Just beyond the snow-capped peaks is a little valley that shelters a veritable sanctuary where the last surviving cedars of Lebanon are protected. Long ago, the cedars covered all the Lebanese mountains. Little by little, however, populations that invaded Lebanon, including the Phoenicians themselves, cut them all down. And our mountains were left bare. Only a few modest forests remain, sprinkled along the western chain. The Lebanese cedar forests that were once used to build the Temple of King Solomon or the sarcophagus of the pharaohs are now sacred trees. Even a setter struck by lightning cannot be cut down. It's entrusted to the chisel of Lebanese sculptor Rudy Rami. In the end, we felt it was useless to try to save this forest if we didn't try to expand it. So we began primarily by reforesting the raised, empty spaces in the forest. And we've also begun to grow to create a second forest of a million cubic meters around the original forest. Back to Beirut. A sure sign of the times is the number of trendy and elegant restaurants found in the capital. And everyone claims to serve authentic Lebanese cuisine. 
Some of the most popular dishes in the Lebanese meze are tabunay, fatouche salad, the kebe, the abranei, curry chickpeas and white bean salad in oil. There are at least 50 different dishes to make a meze. The meze is the pleasure of eating, the pleasure of the palate. You take your time to taste the foods and appreciate them. The variety of dishes makes all the difference. The presentation of the food is beautiful too. You see so many tasty dishes, it's a treat for the eyes and the mouth. A few miles from the littoral, we penetrate the Shuf Mountains, land of the Druze. Although primarily Muslim, the Druze do not believe in the Quran, but rather in the Letters of Wisdom, written by Caliph al-Hakim, who died in Cairo in 1021. Clothed in the traditional white turban and belted black robes and capes, and proudly sporting moustaches, the Druze represent about 7% of the Lebanese population. In the 16th century, Deir el-Kamar, the Monastery of the Moon, was the residence of the emirs who ruled over Lebanon. Still higher up the mountain is found one of the treasures of the Shuf, Beit Eddin. Since the Middle Ages, Lebanon has been composed of little states governed by emirs. In the early 19th century, Emir Bashir II left Deir el-Kamar to go and build his own palace in Beit Eddin. This castle is a true example of oriental architecture, although the initial plans had been entrusted to Italian architects. The Emir lived in the palace until 1840, when he was exiled by the Ottomans. The palace of Beit Eddin, with its magnificent gardens, became the summer residence of the presidents of the Lebanese Republic. Continuing on our trek north, we discover the vast Beka plain that extends to the foot of the Lebanese mountains. The little town of Baalbek on the Damas Road is a commercial center today. In the past, it was the obligatory caravan route connecting Euphrates to the Mediterranean shores. But Baalbek is above all known as an archaeological site. Its findings are testimony to the existence of a religious worship combining Eastern traditions with that of the Romans from the earliest ages. Transformed into a fortress town in 636 by the Arabs, sacked by the Mamelukes in 1260, Baalbek has nevertheless continued to attract visitors. The first prospecting and restoration works didn't get underway until 1890. At the end of the first century BC, under the reign of Augustus on the site of an older sanctuary, the construction of a great temple dedicated to Jupiter began. The six columns of the peristyle give an idea of the scale of the edifice.
Built in the second century, the Temple of Bacchus is well preserved. Reserved to the initiated, this temple was dedicated to the worshippers of vegetation, wine, and certain drugs. Opium was used by the faithful to reach ecstasy as the poppies sculpted over the monumental entrance give evidence. The Palmyra Hotel facing the archaeological site has long been the only establishment welcoming guests who come here from all over the world to admire the Baalbek temples. <laughs> Everyone passed by there on the way to Baalbek and stayed at the hotel. Why? Because the traffic wasn't like today. First, they came by train. It took nine hours from Beirut to Baalbek. Passengers sometimes had to spend one or two nights. The Queen of Holland is here. I even saw General de Gaulle, who visited here several times. The manager of the hotel, a former guide, spent his life taking visitors around the Bacchus and Jupiter temples. Old-fashioned but full of charm, the Palmyra Hotel attracts tourists who dream of staying in the rooms that were once occupied by celebrities. From almost every room in the hotel, you can see the Temple of Jupiter. It's visible from all the rooms, the balconies, terraces, outside, from the gardens, everywhere. 